Hello, my name is Matthew Marquit, and welcome to an updated version of the Beginner's Guide to Bitmap to Material. In this particular video titled Key Points and User Interface, we of course are going to look into the general layout and UI of BTM, but we're also going to look at some of the key things you need to know in order to get started with the program, as well as a few pointers and hotkeys to speed up your workflow. So first, what exactly is Bitmap to Material? Well, most simply put, it's a program that converts basic images into all the various textures you need for modern game-ready materials. Games are a lot of smoke and mirrors, so in order to run a game real-time, you need to optimize the amount of data that's being processed at any given point. So obviously, this means you can't just model out every single brick in a building to make it look as realistic as possible. Instead, you need to use textures to fake a lot of the depth and detail through the use of the complex materials I just mentioned. Originally, the only way to do this was by creating high-poly, high-detail geometry, then you would retopologize the said geometry into lower poly models that could actually run in a game engine, and then you'd bake out all the special textures you needed for your material in order to sell this fake detail. Nowadays, of course, you have options like BTM to help you save time by allowing you to create these same textures by simply plugging in an image, moving a few sliders, and calling it a day. Now, don't get me wrong, though. This doesn't replace the high poly process as the modeling baking approach is still going to give you better results. But this is a great way to create game-ready materials for generic tiling or trim textures or as a way to further manipulate the various texture images you initially created through the modeling slash baking approach. Truth be told, as with the latter point, I see it more as a complement to the overall process where you're going to find certain situations work better for one approach versus the other, or you're going to use both of them at the same time to get the most control possible. All right, so I'm going to assume that you have the software already if you're watching this video, but just in case you do not already have bitmap to material, I'm going to show you how to acquire it. Number one, you need to go to algorithmic.com, and from there you're going to click on the download slash buy button. Once you get to this page, you have the option to download various versions of their software, including Painter, Designer, and of course, Bitmap to Material. Over here, we notice that you have the different operating systems in which you can download it for. Now, just be mindful, if you download any of these free versions, they all come with certain limitations. Painter and Designer both have 30-day trials, as you can see here. Substance Bitmap to Material, however, does not have a trial, but it does have watermarks, which makes it, for all intents and purposes, pretty useless if you want to create anything out of it. You can see what it looks like in the viewport, learn the program, but if you go to export out any of your images, you'll have said watermarks on them. So if you want to get rid of those watermarks, you're going to have to have one of the four licenses found here. We have Indie, Pro, Enterprise, and Educational. The first three require you to be making a certain amount of money per year, while the last one is actually free, which is awesome. The educational one for both students and teachers, what you want to do is you want to create a login through the site, then submit any evidence that you are a student or a teacher. In my case, I used my teacher ID, scanned that in, sent it to them, and within 24 hours, they got back to me and gave me a free one-year license. After the one year runs out, you can always reapply again, as I've done this several times so it's really awesome for as long as you need it while you are still either a student or a teacher so the last thing I want to talk about before I finally jump into bitmap to material is what constitutes a good or bad texture image for use with the program the quality of the image you input directly affects the quality of the image that is output. So if you use a horrible image, don't expect B2M to perform any miracles. These six grass textures are examples of low quality imagery. The first thing to consider is lighting information. All three of the top textures have strong and distracting light issues. There's too much variation of light and shadow in the top left image a strong gradient of light intensity within the top middle image, and overly harsh contrast in the top right image where you can see jet black shadows and pure white highlights. This also means you need to be careful with images taken with a strong flash. You can also see in the majority of these images some perspective issues. As a rule of thumb, use texture images that have been taken at a perfectly perpendicular angle to the camera. This means if you want to use a grass texture, make sure it's taken with a true top-down angle. You basically want to avoid any real sense of perspective at all, be the image tilt, rounded surfaces, fisheye shots, or close-ups that accentuate the three-dimensional aspect of your subject like the grass on the bottom left. Next, you want to make sure that your resolution of your image is as high as possible. The bottom middle texture is awful because it's just too small and pixelated to hold any real data. Finally, the worst of all the culprits can be seen in the bottom right image. This is an example of a texture with a watermark. Nothing screams plagiarism more. 
Keep in mind, some watermarks are hard to spot, but either way, if your texture has a watermark, it means you aren't licensed to use it. So be sure to find royalty-free images to use with your work or just take the texture images yourself. So what does a perfect grass texture actually look like? Well, with this final example, we see what happens when pictures are taken with ideal conditions, such as overcast clouds. There's also a clear absence of any perspective with a perfect top-down shot, all of this leading to the ideal B2M texture image. All right, so this is what it looks like inside the actual program of Bitmap to Material and the basic layout as you would find default. Now, obviously, we have this little 2D section here saying drop a bitmap here. It's pretty much begging for us to drop something in there. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've got an image right here of a metal carving. I'm going to drag and drop that into the 2D viewport. Now, keep in mind, we want the 2D viewport, not the 3D viewport down here. So drop it into the 2D viewport like this. Let go. It's going to give you a bunch of options to choose from. We want to choose load in main input. To be fair, if you actually try to load any of these other inputs in, it won't do anything unless you make some settings changes over in your parameters, but we'll go over that a little bit later. So I'm going to click on main input tweak, and there you go. So now we can see our 2D view, and of course down here our 3D view. So let me just kind of push this right back. So now with our image brought in, I want to talk quickly about the size of the image that you use because it does affect the output within bitmap to material so you typically want to keep your textures at a power of two what that means is a 512 pixel by 512 pixel image or 1024 2048 and so on this is important because bitmap to material only exports out at particular sizes if we look over here under the parameter section we'll see an output size and the default is set to 512 by 512. If, for instance, I had an image that was 3,000 by 3,000 pixels and I brought it in, it would be condensed down to 512 by 512. We can see that because if we look at the 2D viewport, we notice that this is a one-to-one -one ratio. So this image has been shrunk down to fit that 512 pixel count. However, if I come over here and change the default size to 1024, which is actually the size of the image, it now pops up and looks a lot more clear with the one-to-one -one ratio. However, if I decide to go much higher than that, say I want to do a 4096 image right here and we click on that and then we come back over to this image at one to one notice how the texture now looks very blurry this is one to one view but it looks blurry because it has now been scaled up so if we want to make sure that our texture looks nice at whatever resolution we want to output we got to be sure that the texture is larger than the output size that we want or equal to it Okay, so I loaded up this new image just to show you one last thing, which is the shape of your texture. Now, keep in mind that bitmap to material is going to, by default, match any shape into a square. So let's take a look at what this texture actually looks like. As you can see from the image, it's more rectangular. Bitmap to material is actually compressing it back into a square. If we, however, want it to look rectangular, we can come over here to the output size and unlink the two sizes, clicking this button. Once we do that, we can come in and change the size of the texture here. If I then say make this 512 and this 1024, it now has a more rectangular shape. Just note that unless your image was a power of 2, which this image was not, it's not going to perfectly match up as we can see here. Also note, if you're using the default cube in the 3D view, it will always be compressed no matter what because of the shape of the object. So remember, your best bet is to use an input texture image that has a resolution larger or equal to the output size you want, has a power of 2 resolution size, and is a square. So let's take a closer look at B2M's interface. It's actually broken up into five components. We have a drop-down menu, a hotbar, a 2D view, a 3D view, and the parameter section. So let's head up each section one at a time, starting with the drop-down menu. First, we have File here, which lets us do some of the typical things we can find under a file drop-down in most programs. We have our Export, which allows us to export out our images when we're done. The hotkey is F10. You can also find down here in the hotbar the Export as Bitmap button. Our Options, which allows us to do a bunch of things that I'll talk about in a second. Our Windows section, which allows us to turn on and off different viewports. And Help which allows us to learn a little bit more about the program and check out some documentation. Now, going back to the options section, there are a few things to note. Number one, we see our switch engine option, which F9 is the hotkey, or we can go back to the hotbar and click this button. It brings up this dialog box, which allows us to change which rendering engine we're using. 
You want to make sure it's set to Direct 3D 10 so that you can choose textures larger than 2K as an output. Remember, when choosing in this drop-down menu over here, our option would have been limited to just 2K. Now you see we actually have more options, like 4K and 8K. If you want to increase that even further, you go back to Options, click on here, go to Set Size Limit, and choose the option here in this drop-down menu. If we click on this, you can see we can go all the way down to 32K textures, which are pretty ridiculous. However, if I set that to 32K, then hit OK, it's actually going to reset my entire scene. I'll have to put the map back in. But now I can come over here, choose in the output size, and scroll all the way down with an option of up to 32K. The last noteworthy area of options is Set Tangent Space Plugin. This allows us to choose which plugin we want to use to calculate the normals within Bitmap to Material. Different game engines use different tangent space. In this particular case, we have the Unity one set with the Unity space.dll. If we click this button here, we can choose in the location found here, this different space upon clicking this one and hitting open, you'll see that this one works for both Blender, XNormal, and the Unreal Engine. The user interface of B2M is also very customizable. Each one of these windows has two buttons. We can see the X here that will shut off the window. If we click on this, we shut off the 2D view. We can always go back to the window drop down and turn it back on. The other button allows it to be a floating tab. This floating tab can then be moved to a different monitor or somewhere else within the UI. If I grab and move it, we can see here, it will get highlighted blue, showing me where it's gonna place it. If it double highlights an entire screen, like this 3D view here, and I let go of it, it now becomes a tab view with the 3D view. So we can see 2D view and 3D view. And of course, if we just wanna change it back, we can always go to Window and click on Reset Layout. So I've enlarged the 2D view so we can better see what's going on in this particular view. The first thing you might notice is the output section. This is basically all the maps that Bitmap to Material will calculate out using the base image you inserted into the beginning of the program. We can see here that it has base color, roughness, metallic, normal, height, and ambient occlusion. Now these are all the defaults. You can actually add or take away some of these from here. If we go over to the output section under parameters, we'll see which of these are on and which of these are off. If say I wanted to add a displacement map, I can click on on, and you'll notice that we now have a displacement tab. If I want to remove it, obviously I just click on the off and it will go away. The same can be said with any of these other tabs. So while there aren't any hotkeys that let you move around in the 2D view, there are some physical elements in the UI that will allow you to navigate within the image. We can see right here the slider that if we're zoomed in enough, lets us move up and down. Now the default, as I've alluded to before, is one to one view. So we see the texture at the size that it really is. We can change this to hit fit so that it matches the window of whatever we have here. We can also change it to different magnification levels, such as 12% all the way up to 1600% if you wish to do that. Right next to that drop down menu is also this menu, which allows you to have other options within the window. You can also access this window by right clicking in any of the texture view windows. Some of the most noteworthy things are being able to save out your image or copy it to a clipboard so you can paste it into a program like Photoshop. Furthermore, you can also split your view either vertically or horizontally or completely close it. I find splitting it horizontally actually helps quite a bit. Now with a split view, we can see two different texture images being displayed. If we want even more, we can continue to do this by right clicking in another window and picking the same option again to split horizontally and so on. We can obviously click on different tabs to get different texture maps to show up. If you want to get rid of any of them, we can do the same thing by right clicking and then clicking close view. All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about in this video is the 3D viewport. In order to navigate in the 3D viewport, you want to click on the left mouse button and hold down to rotate. If you press the right mouse button and move up and down with your mouse, you can zoom in and out. Finally, if you press the middle mouse button and hold it down, you can pan. If you somehow get your object off screen, there's a couple ways of fixing that. You can either hit F to refocus it, or if you've got your camera all rotated and object moved off, you can hit R to reset your view. So now let me talk about the drop-down menu found here in the 3D viewport. The first item is geometry. If you click on this, it actually allows you to choose the mesh your texture is being displayed on. Currently, I'm using a rounded cube. However, you can use different models such as a cylinder, an inner box, a sphere, or you can even load up your own mesh if you have one. If you click on this, it allows you to choose a autodesk.fbx file, which both 3 Studio Max and Maya export, or some of these other options, including OBJ files. The next item on the list is materials. 
If we go over here and click on materials, go to default and choose definitions, we can see that the default shader is the metallic roughness. However, if you're using a specular gloss, you can change that here. If we go to channels, we see a list of textures that can be toggled on or off in the viewport only. Meaning, if you toggle any of these texture channels, you will not affect your output imagery. Finally, if you click on edit, we'll find a few additional settings we can change over here, including the intensity of the emissive if you happen to have one, turning the normal on or off within the viewport, and changing how often the texture tiles on the geometry. Keep in mind this tiling is happening only in the viewport, as we can see no updates to our base color texture up here. The next item is lights, though before I hit that up, I'm going to go over to display here, I'm going to turn on the point light. If we click back on display again, you're going to see you can also add a wireframe, a grid, an axis, or a bounding box, though I don't find any of those particularly useful. However, I'm going to go over to lights here and then choose edit in order to bring up some light settings. One such setting is turning the point light on or off. Now visibly under the display, I turned it on so you can see which direction it's facing. However, over here in these options, you can actually shut the point light completely on and off. So if I go up to display here and shut off light again, that's just hiding the icon that shows where the light is located. Let me turn that back on. Now let me zoom in and see how we can move this light around in the scene. If you hold down shift and use the right mouse button, you can actually zoom the proximity of the light back and forth to the mesh. If you hold down shift and use the left mouse button, we can rotate the light around the object. We can also change both the color of this point light or the intensity of this point light over here. However, if we don't like any of the things we changed, we can always go back up to lights and click reset to restore the default settings. Then we have our next drop down item, which is camera over here, which allows us to change to different views such as perspective, front, back, and so on. We can also save a viewport image. We can copy a viewport image to our clipboard, or we can even save out a full render. Of course, we can also reset our entire camera as I showed you before with R. If we go up to edit under camera, we can change a couple other things, including focal length and so on. But I just want you guys to know real quick, if you go over to projection and you change that to one, you can actually see that our view is now in an orthographic view if we desire to see it that way. Following camera is environment. If we click on an environment and then go to edit, we get some settings that allows us to change the environment around our objects, including the visibility of the scene by clicking on or off here. We can also change the exposure by moving this slider here. We can also change the rotation of the environment around the object by moving this circular dial. Then if we want, if we go under scene, we can go to edit and this basically just lets us turn on or off the mesh within the scene. If for whatever reason we want to change the background environment, we can do that also. If I come over here, I have an image already prepared. If you find a 360 panorama image, you can easily just drag that into the background, let go, and set this to the latitude longitude panorama. It'll take a few seconds to load up, but once it does, you can see now we have a new background with new lighting to boot. All right, so that pretty much wraps up everything I want to talk about for this particular video. If you want to learn more about the parameter section found over here, watch the following video in the series. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.